Welcome, movie fans, to the Pride Month episode of Hollow Victories, where love wins. Not that that means much. I am your host, Matt Prisons, joined, as always, by my token straight co-host. Hello, my name is Glendal Gladackle. And uh, we are joined today by a very special guest who asked nicely if they could be in this episode. Please introduce yourself. Hi, I'm Mitzi. I'm here, I'm queer, and I'm not very fond of beer. So. That's true. Um. I tried to force feed them beer earlier and they wouldn't do it, take it. <laughs> uh, and uh, today for, for our Pride Month episode, we've got a very special matchup. It's uh, sort of an old versus new, which we, we haven't really done i suppose uh we had the two left behind movies that were separated by about 14 years that's the biggest gap usually we try to pick movies from around the same era but today it's two movies from two different eras that are both just infamous for being some of like the craziest movies ever made it's ed wood's glinner glinda versus sam rarovich's ben and arthur we got the oars and the ands. I've Glenn seen weirder Mark. on this show. Like I'm not, I'm not, I'm not like necessarily bad mouth in either of these. It's just like it's kind of fun. I, I don't know. Like they're definitely both very weird movies, but I, I feel like, like infamously the most bizarre or crazy. I don't know. Um. Weirder than Ben and Arthur, maybe. I don't know if we've seen anything weirder than Glenn or Glinda. Glenn or, Glenn, Glenn or Glenda just kind of gets really artsy near the end of it, where that I, I could say that seems pretty bizarre. But I think the weirdest thing about that movie, though, is just hearing them say some of the things they're saying in that time period. Then, uh, Mitzi, would you like to introduce Glenn or Glenda for us? Sure, I'll do that for you. Um, Glenn or Glenda is a documentary-ish movie about a guy who cross-dresses and Bella Lugosi is there intermittently uh, spouting off some real weird shit about mankind and the human consciousness and experience. And it was more, like, empathetic to the trans community than most of the stuff that came out in the 80s or 90s. <laughs> That's, and it came out in the 50s, the whole 50s. <laughs> yeah, I it's it, it is as sympathetic as anything could be to trans people in the fifties. Yeah. It is still noticeably out of date, but like, yes, it is still very much in the fifties. But Chris and I had a big conversation about it. Actually, it feels like it feels like it's out of date, but it also like it was it was at least someone having a conversation about that it was someone part of that to an extent part of that community i know in that movie it's more so he just likes to dress up in women's clothing rather than actually wants to switch over but they do talk about both i think most of it just comes down to like he was probably projecting like what his experience was a bit too much and kind of assuming that's what it is for everyone but maybe it's easy to assume that when not a lot of people are talking about it uh, yeah. Yeah, I mean, th this started off as, like, a Christine Jorgensen biopic. Uh, Christine Jorgensen, of course, the, the woman who uh, had a sex change back in the 50s, which made big news, even though it was, like, far from the first time that it happened. She mm -hmm. was just, like, the first big popular trans woman. Uh, and it, it was supposed to be based on Christine Jorgensen's life, but then... Uh, as depicted in Ed Wood, uh, the trade papers got a hold of it and Christine Jorgensen started demanding more money. And so they just sort of, the, the producer's just like, okay, just like make it about some other trans woman. And then Ed Wood <laughs> made it entirely about himself until the last like 10, 15 minutes where then it's about a, a trans woman. Yeah. Yeah. It's story number two, which is like, uh... Like not even one third of story number one. It takes up significantly less time. There's so there's a lot less time dedicated to that one. The the movie is framed like there, there's like a detective and he finally finds like a trans woman dead from suicide, which is like 
an unfortunate reality, especially in the 50s, but even mm-hmm. still today. And he he goes to this, like, doctor, and this doctor, like, starts explaining, like, what cross-dressers and, and transsexuals and transvestites are to him. They define the word transvestite, like, eight times in this movie. Yeah. <laughs> they, go, they go over and over and over that one. And it's like, that's not even, like, a word people use anymore. It's kind of much. Like, it's kind of seen almost as almost a derogatory term. Yeah, now. it's 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 not seen as like particularly couth today. I um, nor is transsexual really. It's it's transgender. Yeah. yeah, I it's so like I feel like back in the day, cross dressing as well as like being you know trans and like being gay even was all seen as sort of the same thing. It's, like, it's all just sort of, like, the same pot of, like, yeah. undesirables. <laughs> like, I, there is something that's always kind of funny to me about, like, 50s transphobia. Because they're like, oh, you've got the surgery? Well, I guess you're a woman now. <laughs> like, on the one hand, it's reductive because it's like, you're boiling a woman down to just her genitals. But at the same time, they didn't have, like, this... Matt Walsh, what is a woman bullshit? It was like, oh, you, you got a vagina? You're abroad. Yeah. No, you said the worst <laughs> joke to me after we after we finished watching this movie. You're like, you want to be abroad? That's fine. Get your ass in the kitchen. <laughs> like, <laughs> Yeah, no, that's, that's how it was in the 50s. It's like, you, you still have, like, horrible gender stereotypes, but it's like, all right, you want to be this? Sure, go ahead. You get all the baggage that comes with it. The particularly strange thing about this is, like, Bella Lugosi is there, and you kind of think he's supposed to be, like, the narrator or something, but he's not. It's this, like, doctor that the detective has gone yeah, to. Yeah, no, he's literally he, just there. He's the narrator. Bella Lugosi just, like, shows up and spouts nonsense. And Ed Wood, like, kind of explains that well, but, like, if you never saw Ed Wood, that'd be so fucking confusing. It, it was really just, like, that helped him get the movie made. He got a star in it. Yeah. And if if you watch Ed Wood's movies... He he writes very strange dialogue. His his dialogue tends to be like very broad, very wordy, but like kinda meaningless. <laughs> like one of my favorite lines from Plan 9 is when Chriswell says, Future events such as these will affect you in the future. And it's like, yeah, that's that's how the future works, my man. <laughs> so a, a lot of the dialogue is these, like, broad, but, like, sort of hollow statements. Like, they try to sound profound, but you're like, what do you mean by that? Uh-huh. <laughs> I love this movie. I think this movie is really funny. I, what, yeah. about you, what about you, Michael? How do you feel about it? I think it's really funny, but I also do think it's interesting just because of, like, as much, you know, I I, I, I I definitely have less ground to talk about this than, like, Mitzi does, for example. But I will say, just from talking to you and Chris about it, and also just from my experience watching it, as much as it get it gets wrong, it does get, like, there's some stuff that he says in this movie that I hear people say today, and that's, like, kind of fascinating to me. It, it, it like you said, it's like it, it's more sympathetic towards the trans community than any movie or like from the eighties or nineties because because it feels very genuine. That's what I like about it is it does feel like I think that it's like a very personal project and I think you can see that and it makes me like appreciate it more than like I said like I'm, it's at a point where I keep saying the majority of stuff we watch in the show. I do think we've watched a fair number of passion projects now for Hollow Victories. Um, yeah, but, uh, but uh, yeah, this one definitely stands out as like one of the better movies we've watched on here. Cause I, there, are, I do think it's funny. I was laughing and Mitz even made a good point about this in the Ed Wood, uh, out of the ring episode, but I was laughing how frequently he had to mention that he wasn't gay. Um, because he was just word for word stating the same thing. Uh, like for the first, he eventually stopped, but for the first 40 minutes, I think he says it like seven times. Um, it's the same spiel. It's like. But yeah, and, and like all the stuff with uh, 
you know, Bella was really, you know, it, it, it's really weird, and especially during that fucking artsy scene near the end, where it just keeps cutting back to him watching it, like, kind of, like, confused oh, yeah. by what he's seeing. <laughs> yeah, the part where it just turns into a lesbian porno for a good minute, like, yeah. yeah. That, that's the thing, like, you have this, like, I there's this genre I kind of like to call exploitation, where it's, like, Oh, we're teaching you something, wink, wink. This is a PSA. But it's always, like, really exploitative material that's just, like, supposed to be, like, shocking and sensational. So, you know, something like, uh... Uh, a reefer madness would Mm -hmm. fall into this category. Or, or, uh... The Lusting Hour, which I talked about on my sh- oh, on my I show. That one. I love that movie. The fucking anti-porn movie that is also a porn movie. <laughs> um, but Glenn or Glinda, it, it, it has that, like, exploitation elements in that it's, like, explaining all these, like, concepts about trans people and cross-dressers and all that. But, like, if you take that out, this is just, like... An avant-garde experimental film. Yeah. <laughs> like this this feels at home with like the weird avant-garde movies gay people were making in like the 60s and 70s. Right? This feels like something Jack Smith or Andy Warhol could have made. And like I I can't give it credit for like being avant-garde or, or being like uh, this smart brilliant movie because i've seen ed wood's other movies i know how he makes movies and i yeah. know he just like he just made a bad movie he wasn't trying to be weird or experimental he just made a bad movie but it feels like an avant-garde film. it feels <laughs> experimental it feels kind of brilliant He's he's brilliant on accident. That's still brilliant. <laughs> <laughs> I think that uh, I, I you know just from you know watching this and what I've seen in Ed Wood, it, it feels like he was a director who was very passionate about getting his stuff made, and he did rush a lot of things in the process because he, I mean, he was smart about it. To be fair, like he he knew like you know he was careful with his budget. He was, but still like putting in the work to get everything done. He was <laughs> doing. He would be a little bit sneaky sometimes if he had to be. But his his crew all loved him a lot. From again, from what I've seen in the Ed Wood movie, I I can't say all of this with a complete certainty. But I'm assuming the Ed Wood movie painted him somewhat truthfully. So I, I don't know. There's just something like charming about it. Even like uh, I I know I, I know that's kind of weird. Like because you do just want to talk about the movie on its own. But I have grown, I, I, I do think that watching Ed Wood gave Glenn and Glenda a bit of an advantage, because now I, like, if I didn't have that context, I don't know if I would have liked it nearly as much as I did, but with that context, there's just, uh, yeah, there, there's just something very enjoyable about the stuff he makes. We, we could do, like, a, like, Plan 9 versus Bride of the Monster, just do a full Ed Wood episode talk about his hey, other yeah. two biggest movies i would love that um yeah, I, I think it's it's very um it's like you said it adds to it to know a lot about the person like i lost my train of thought and then i just like i'm trying to get back to it <laughs> like it's it it helps the movie to know about ed wood as a human being maybe, maybe you could argue any of these movies that we've talked about in hollow victories uh, would like help to know the person who made them like I, I, that's what i'm saying it's a big advantage you know yeah, uh, but I, especially especially when you're talking about a movie as strange as Glenn or Glinda, for sure. Like yeah, if, like I, I mean, they even showed it in Ed Wood. Like people were watching this and they're like, "What the fuck am I watching?" <laughs> well, some of them thought it was supposed to be funny, uh, and a lot yeah. of people, and a lot of people yeah. even to this day, like uh, you know, like we're, we're we're talking about how funny we thought it was. Uh, people still think it's funny, you know, like but but I don't. I definitely think that the people laughing at it now would be laughing at it in a different context, <laughs> but uh, still, yeah. like, but yeah, it was, uh, yeah, people like either scratched their head or laughed, and I think that's, uh, I think that's probably still true <laughs> with, with Ed Wood's I movies. I don't know. I think just getting a reaction out of it is still, like, effective art, you know what I mean? Oh, like, I agree. Yeah. Like I said, I, like he's he's a genius on accident, but he's st- oh, yeah. <laughs> that's still genius. I I think there is a very strong argument to be made that like Glenn or Glinda inspired later 
film. They later like experimental films. Yeah. David like, Lynch, you know, he's a very famous director yeah. who does experimental. He listed Glenn or Glenda as one of his favorite movies of all time. That makes complete sense to me, right? Yeah. This this absolutely seems up uh, David Lynch's alley, you know? <laughs> I do like how, like, vulnerable this movie is. Like, I'm not gonna lie, like, the, it, yeah, it does give it a big advantage to watch Ed Wood because it's like, I appreciate this movie no more knowing how much vulnerability went into this movie like no don't laugh that's like that's real that's genuine yeah, I, I, I agree with you <laughs> I, I think that it like I, I agree with that because it's like if you watch this not knowing that you might be like okay like who's who's saying all this you might you might see scenes near the end where they're describing why he's feeling this way and be like, yeah, I, the person who made this was not like part of this community but like no, like I think I think watching it would have known it. Now you're like, okay, it, it is part of that. He just didn't like, you know, he was just speaking for himself a bit too much, but, but it's okay. It's a movie he's expressing. You're allowed to make a movie where you express your own thoughts, you know, your own feelings towards something. But I mean, it's, it's not even just like the story of Ed Wood and his cross-dressing. Cause you've also got like, Bella Lugosi in there, and he like yeah. says all the and like with with all this like stock footage playing over him. <laughs> so it's it, part of it is like Edward's personal story, but also part of it is just like Edward trying to make his movie right. Right. He loves Bella Lugosi. He loves stock footage, and it's like yeah, we're gonna like put all this into the movie. He loves cross dressing. There and, we go. Like, it, <laughs> That's that's sort of the weird thing. He just like he put all his favorite things into this movie, and it's like these don't go together. <laughs> I I love that. It feels like how I decorate. I no, do like I, it. I mean, uh, <laughs> that's part of why I think it feels so avant garde. You know, it's just that he threw all of this weird disparate stuff together i put all my favorite things in a bucket and i shook it up <laughs> i i will say that really like like artsy scene at the end like the, it goes on for a while it's like 15 minutes long um yeah. Yeah. definitely the weirdest part of the movie i will say at the very least i i definitely think there is questionable decisions in how he handled that scene but i do think i understand what he was going for it's just like a scene of his consciousness. Like he's ve he is horrified of telling his soon to be wife about this stuff because he thinks it's going to ruin it, and in reality, it did. And uh, and yeah, I think it was just kind of building on that like fear for the character, and it only goes away once he comes clean about it, once he tells his fiance about it. Um, so I, I the visuals. I think maybe some of them fit what he was trying to express. Others, it's kind of like, where I, where are you going with this? How does this connect? But that probably go, applies right back to what you just said, by the way, Matt. I do, at the end of the day, I, I can say that, like, as weird as it is, I do think he communicated it at least somewhat. Like, I think I do under, I think that was the point. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Like I said before in the, um, Out of the Ring, I think, like, this is also the product of a guy who's sick and tired of explaining himself and just wants to be able to point to a movie and be like, here, here it is. Mm -hmm. This is all you need to know and I will say it to you over and over again. And I, like, I think that does explain some of like the repetitiveness when they, they talk about like the more technical aspects of it. Right. I, I, I think this movie's fun and hilarious. I do think there are parts that drag on and it's mostly because of that, just just like the technical, okay, we're going to blather about all this, oh, this is what a transsexual is, and this is well, why, why, how people cross-dress and why people cross-dress. There will be a vocab quiz later. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, I do also think that scene near the end maybe started to drag on, like the weird silent scene that's all like very impressionistic. And yeah. Bella Lugosi's just watching it happen. I love that. I That's my favorite part of the movie is it just keeps cutting back to him. 
My I love- favorite moment. My favorite moment is when like the trans woman walks in. And he just like he's like it's a man, and he just like swipes his hand, and the man disappears, and then he points the other direction, and a woman <laughs> appears, and it's like, yep, that's how that's how being trans works. Bella Lugosi makes you disappear and makes you reappear as a woman. Yes, exactly. <laughs> he's the Jesus of gay people. <laughs> You, ca- you um, called him the Pope of gay people. We were watching Better Arthur. I did. <laughs> I like that. <laughs> Dracula, Pope of gay people. <laughs> That's. Uh, I, I mean, do we even need to talk about the cast on this one? Because like, Bella Lugosi is like the only real name here. Edward. Yeah, too. no, that's kind of how he got his movies going. I, honestly, really. I mean, but like, like Edward is. Edward's the director. This right. is Edward's movie. I don't think any of the performances stood out as like disinterested. I'll say that. Oh yeah, uh, I I love the part where like Bella is just like reacting to the things that are going on in the lesbian porno and everything like that. It's like live Bella Lugosi reaction, <laughs> like. Just to do an edit where you just take all the shots of him reacting and put it, like, in the corner of the screen. Yeah, yeah. No, I love that. Like, it's literally just him sitting there reacting to things. It's like, they did it. They made reaction videos before they were a thing. Yeah. <laughs> the thing is, like, Bella Lugosi probably had no idea what he was reacting to in those yeah. scenes. Oh, yeah, like, he was right. just making faces at the camera. <laughs> I, I, I mean... I think some of this movie was made in the editing room. Oh, for sure. Um, I think it... The, the the sort of weird thing about Bela Lugosi being there is it almost makes this feel like a horror movie in parts. Especially because, like, Ed Wood's other movies are just, like, horror movies. That's what he was known for making, was, was horror movies. Mm-hmm. So you throw it in this movie and it's sort of like, ooh, scary transsexuals. <laughs> Although it's it's still probably better than the the Doris Wishman film Let Me Die a Woman, which which is like a full on documentary, like mm. actual documentary about trans women. That includes full footage of the surgery happening. Oh, cool. Um <laughs> But uh the funny thing about that movie is there'll be, like, some doctor and he's just, like, explain, like calmly explaining what trans people are. And it's like, yeah, sometimes people's uh, preferred gender does not align with uh, their birth gender. And then they'll just be, like, a horror movie sting <laughs> yeah. right after he says that. Yeah, no, it's it's weird how it's, like, it's like a documentary that's framed like a horror movie <laughs> like you've hmm. got the documentary painting and then around the border you've just got this like gothic horror like framing that doesn't make no sense but like if you wanted to give this a more charitable interpretation you could just be like wow this is really saying something about how society reacts to transsexuals <laughs> and i mean that is something they like discuss in the film like they they do bring up like the, the christian jorgensen story and how like it's not unique it's not special it's something that's happened many times i think that maybe like a better way i, I say a better way this movie is exactly what it needs to be but like but, you know, like, the better way to use Bela Lugosi is that he, maybe they, because like, there is a scene that I think, think could have been painted as more of a horror, which it is that really weird experimental scene where he's, like, having, like, like a, you know, fears of what happens once the truth comes out. Uh, so there's definitely, like, an area where you could throw in that horror element. In fact, I think they do in that scene, but it does make me question why wasn't he just involved in that scene in the first place? He could be narrating that scene, you know? That would have been a better place I, I for the mean, narration I, than just randomly I at the know, beginning. I, feel like... I don't understand why he isn't just the narrator. Yeah. He seems That's to be true. the narrator, but then they, they throw to this, like, other random guy to narrate the whole thing. And it's like, what happened to Bella Lugosi? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, right, like weird. Bella Lugosi is now telling you a story about another guy telling another guy a story. 
It's a, it's a story within a story uh, within you, a story. You know, he's he's <laughs> famous for playing Dracula, but that's more like uh, Mary Shelley's Frankenstein. You know, being a vampire is a lot like being a transsexual. <laughs> Hi, I'm Bella <laughs> <laughs> you know, if you, if you ever read Frankenstein, it's crazy because it's like Frankenstein is framed as a story from this boat captain, and the boat captain then starts relaying Doctor Frankenstein's story. But then Doctor Frankenstein like meets up with his monster, and the monster spends like three chapters explaining his story. And I'm like, we are three layers deep on story here. <laughs> Michael, do you have anything else to say about Glenn or Glinda? Uh, no. Uh, I enjoyed it. It, it's interesting. Listen to the Out of the Ring. Give yourself yeah. more context. Yeah. No, we we talked about Tim Burton's Ed Wood. Yeah. Um, which is a very good movie. Absolutely. Uh, well, if we, if we don't have anything else for Glenn or Glinda, maybe we should move on to uh, uh, Ben and Arthur. Let's do it. So Ben Ben and Arthur is the story of two gay men. Ben and Arthur, who want to get married, but it's the early 2000s, and gay marriage rights are, like, in a weird place, so they're kind of bouncing all over the country, trying to find a place where they can get married. Also, uh, Ben has to clear up a divorce he was in, and Arthur has to deal with his crazy religious brother who's, like, super homophobic, and his church is super homophobic. They kick him out of the church because his brother's gay. That's how homophobic they are. Even though he's homophobic, too. (laughs) But he's he's played by a gay porn star. (laughs) And uh, the the director, Sam Rarevich, I hope I'm saying that even close to right. But also, I don't really care because he's one of the few people who is, like, directly claimed one of my videos that's something maybe worth mentioning i think this is the first movie we've covered that i also talked about on matt's fun time bad movie show maybe i feel like i'm wrong i feel like we've done one before now but perhaps i'm pretty sure this is the first one that i have also talked about on matt's you, fun time weird movie show you didn't do any it of was, the rapsy street kids or anything like that did you no um, I might have done a quickie on the Christmas tree. Even that, no, no, I didn't. No, I don't think I've reviewed any of the movies we've talked I think this is the first time we're talking about a movie I've also done a review of. Granted, that was, like, year one, and I know it was year one because I kept making jokes about Ben and Arthur in my top ten videos from, of top ten moments from my first year. Which is one of the few old videos I've made that I, I can still, like, tolerate watching. <laughs> because it's just such a shit post. I can't tolerate <laughs> watching your older videos because your hair just looks wrong. I'm sorry, honey. You had a bad haircut. <laughs> it was not I, a good look. I, I had a great haircut. Okay, a few of those I had bad haircuts. But I had great hair when I was in high school. <laughs> yeah, Michael, what'd you think of Ben and Arthur? I, I'm sorry if this is going to be disappointing. I, I definitely laughed at some of it. There are things about it that I found funny, but all in all, I was just kind of bored. Huh. There were parts where I wasn't really paying much attention because there wasn't really much going on. It, it felt like, like it was dragging out a, mo- a story that you could do in 10 to 15 minutes to an hour and 30 minutes. Like It did, like, we were like 15 minutes in where I was like, how long is this movie? And it's because, like, so much happened in the first 15 minutes. Like, just so much that I was like, we gotta be close to the end by now. And it's like, oh, okay, all right, never mind. We've still got, like, an hour left. So, uh, yeah, okay. It is a short movie. Both of these are pretty short movies. And (laughs) this one's weird, though, because, uh, you know, you said, like, so much happens right at the beginning. Things just keep happening in this film. <laughs> yeah, like no. there is there is no rhyme or reason for what is about to happen next in the movie. I, at least not until you get to like the very end. I genuinely at the start thought this was gonna be a movie about 
Okay, so I thought, here's my whole process throughout the movie, right? Ben and Arthur are going to go to Hawaii to get married. I'm like, oh, okay, that sounds great. So we're going to Hawaii, and then they find out that they're not going to get married in Hawaii, but they still have the plane tickets that they paid for, and you can't get the plane tickets refunded. And I was like, oh, okay, so they're going to go to Hawaii anyway and have, like, a nice trip. No, they don't do that either. Um, and then all of a sudden, at some point, it cuts to them doing their jobs, and it's just like, <laughs> uh, <laughs> for some reason, there's I... one woman drinking out of a Subway cup, but nobody else is drinking out of Subway cups, and that bothered me. Actually, it might have been a Quiznos <laughs> cup. But, like, it, <laughs> he just quits his job for no reason that does not come up in the rest of the movie that has no plot relevance yeah, to any they don't, other part. They... Like, he's standing there like, oh, I hate this job, I'm gonna quit. But it's like, could you show us why his job sucks first? Like, I, I honestly forgot that was even in the movie until it came up. And I'm like, oh yeah, fucking this scene. Because it, it ties into nothing. Yeah, no. It's just five minutes of literal nothing. Um... Oh yeah, but before that, he the uh, Ben talks about being in the like still wrapping up a divorce, but it turns out he hadn't even mentioned the divorce to his wife yet. So like, or being gay to yeah, his wife. No, nothing. Well, what, what, absolutely what nothing. What was that like? Was because that that like bet like um, fucking Arthur was confused by that too. Like when he said that, like it was like news to him. So. How was this happening? Did the wife just accept that he wasn't coming home for three years? Because they say three years. Or or is he, like, seeing both of them at the same time and just neither of them questioned it once? <laughs> That's what it sounds like to me. Like, neither of them knew about each other for three years. Like, how? How did that happen? How do you go to, like, a three-year relationship with somebody... And, and not mention, oh, hey, yeah, I actually have a wife. Like, even if she's just your fucking beard, man. Like, how the fuck do you not mention that? It's it's an unlikable character trait, too. It's like he's, you know, he's lying to this person that he's seeing now. He's cheating on, you know, he's cheating on his wife for three years without saying anything. Like, both, both, you know, obviously the wife turns out to be a pretty shitty person, but not knowing that at the point, both sides are being wronged by him. Um, yeah. I, that's the weird thing about this movie, right? Like, everyone is a piece of shit in this movie. Pretty much. Yeah, And it's yeah. like... There like, are no I, good I guys. It's, it's like... Usually I don't like movies like that, but I found this one enjoyable. Yeah, you're trying to, like, tell a political message. You're trying to be like, oh, yeah, gays should have the right to get married, and, like, homophobia is dumb and terrible, but, like, you've made your gay characters as shitty as your homophobic characters, so... Pretty much. I really don't know whose side I'm supposed to be on. <laughs> the drama. The, on the, the side of the drama. In the, <laughs> in the same scene, they had Ben do something that I was like, like, Arthur was overreacting to. Like, that wasn't that big of a deal. Uh, th this doesn't warrant this reaction. And then he immediately after did something that he underreacted to. Like, the, okay, that was a big deal. He shouldn't have done that. Because he says, he just gets like a little bit, he raises his voice a little bit because uh, Arthur didn't lock his bike up. Like, he asked, like, so it got stolen. It wasn't a, he didn't say anything that bad. He just like kind of raised his voice for a second. You know, it's uncalled for, but he, you, it sounded like he just said something like unforgivable to him based on the reaction you got, you know? And then immediately after he like smacks him in the face or punches him. It's weird because it looked like a punch, but the sound effect was a slap. Um, and then he's bleeding and then, and that's when they make up. And it's like, that's, you're that, that's okay. Good. That's a good look for this movie. <laughs> Yeah, that's not the greatest relationship in the world. Yeah, like you yeah, know, it looked like it looked like he like came in for a slap, and then he like knocks Ben out or, or Arthur. I fucking forget which one is which. God damn it! Arthur's the director. Ben's the one with the Arthur's the one with the or no, Ben's the one with the good tits. Okay. <laughs> yeah, he, he like slaps Arthur, and it's he just knocks him out cold, and he's bleeding. 
There's definitely a lot to talk about with this movie. There's definitely a lot of things about it that I found funny. It was just as a whole, it was kind of lose on my interest because it felt like it just constantly felt like we were on the same shit. Like, yes, things kept happening. You're right. Things kept happening. But none of them really helped develop other things that happened in the movie. Like, it was. Yeah, no, it felt like nothing was happening. Yeah, no, I get that. There's Um, this part where, like, this woman's just explaining uh, civil, like. (laughs) partnership oh, or yeah. whatever and it's it's just that she's just explaining what that is that, legally <laughs> that almost i i mean you know we were talking about like glenn or glenda clearly being a very personal film i think ben and arthur is clearly a very personal film right mm-hmm. like we, we talk about movies from the 2000s being kind of dated but when we say that we're usually talking about like the style it's this is like the 2000s style this is sort of dated to the 2000s just because of like the ways it talks about homosexuality and gay marriage and even like specifically yeah. addressing where gay marriage was at in that time period yeah uh that's like a big part of the movie and it's it's like the one thing I can unironically give the film credit for is like This is true. This is like the one film that sort of accurately depicts where gay marriage was at in the early 2000s. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's the only thing I can get it. There's... Everything else is terrible. Like we've we've spent all this time criticizing the writing. We haven't even gotten into how cheap the movie is. Oh, oh yeah. yeah. No, I I said before like The only thing you really have to change about this movie is the audio and video quality, and you have a perfect comedy. (laughs) You have a perfect comedy. I think audio-wise, this is the worst. Like, it's not the worst movie we've seen for Hollow Victories, but audio-wise, this is the worst one. Uh, Yeah, this might have, like, the worst production. Well, it's hard to stack it up against, like, uh, the Christmas Tree and Rhapsody Street Kids. But Better those audio. Are both animated movies. Better as far audio. As, like, li- as far as live action movies, this probably has like the lowest production value of anything we've watched. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, 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 like, yeah, I would agree with it's that. It's so clearly filmed in just like some guy's apartment <laughs> with like the cheapest camera they could get. Using the microphone inside the camera. It looks like it was filmed for the 48-hour film press. <laughs> they had some excellent set design for that church scene, though. Okay, yes, the <laughs> church was amazing. I loved the church. Everything about the church was just beautiful, magical. That Jesus. <laughs> the beautiful Jesus painting. <laughs> the crooked cardboard cru- the. Uh, cross Matt, in the we, background. Can we put that Jesus painting in like the, not the thumbnail, but in like this video and just like in the middle of the two movies? Sure. Can we just put him right there so he's watching over us? <laughs> okay. Sure. Oh, you're going to say if you could hang it up in your apartment. Yes, that too. Matt, let's, I need, let's I need a, a print of that. Let's get a of print that. of that and just hang it up. <laughs> I need a print of that Jesus painting. They do close up on it in, in a moment. They do. Yeah. <laughs> Which is ridiculous. And, like, yeah, and the audio um, is just someone, like, cursing, right? That was great. Yeah, um, no, um, that, that church is clearly made of cardboard. <laughs> that is a cardboard church. <laughs> uh, and, like, uh, the acting's, like, pretty bad, but it, it's also, like, clearly they didn't rehearse any of this. Oh, yeah. It's like, there are moments where they, like, noticeably flub their line or they like step over each other's lines Mm -hmm. (laughs) like that happens multiple times throughout the film Mm -hmm. i'd be willing to bet there wasn't a script and he just told them what to say on the spot that's how i used to make my videos when i was in high school i bet he did the same thing uh i i think there might have been a script but uh it it is clear that the like they they leave one too many errors in here, much like uh, Mr. Ed Wood. Sam Rirovich is someone who did one take and was like, "Yeah, that's good. Moving on." Right, and I understand that. I that's how I was. I don't really do a lot of filmmaking necessarily these days, I, but I get it. <laughs> it's just the wanting to move on and being afraid you're not going to finish it if you don't move on. Yeah. But uh but it definitely shows. That's you know, like 
that's an excuse, uh, and it's an excuse I understand, but yeah, it is still an excuse. It does, it does overall, it's going to hurt the quality of what you're making. There was also a scene with an office that looked like it was made of cardboard and tinfoil. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the office, I kind of, I don't buy that it's an office, but I buy that it's like a real place that they sort of dressed to look like an office. Mm-hmm. I think the part of the movie that made me laugh the hardest is there's the scene, like, like actual buildup of them. Uh, he, you mentioned it in the line, like, he was making his homemade holy water. But, uh... <laughs> oh, yeah! Uh, my recipe for holy water. <laughs> yeah, and it was like they tried to make a potion. They taped it to his door, like, an unlabeled bottle. And then when he... When, like It's like, it's a scene in the movie that is so funny, it almost feels like it may have been funny on purpose, but I can't tell with him. Because his brother, because then Arthur opens the door, and, and he just, like, laughs and immediately knows what it is, and they throw it out, and, like, it goes nowhere, but then the brother misinterprets that, like, it's, like, what, what not even misinterprets, it's, like, he didn't drink the potion, what? And it's, like, <laughs> he didn't drink the random bottle of liquid I taped to his door? <laughs> right, like, even if the brother didn't know that it was from him, and what it was, why would he drink it? Why was that your plan, like... Uh, <laughs> but, yeah, but no, like, but just sense. the fact that he knows that it's a potion that his brother put there makes it so much funnier. I fucking love the private investigator he hires and the guy's just like, oh, I, I think what you're doing is morally wrong. <laughs> <laughs> and then they just move on. <laughs> and he says, yeah, I'm paying you though. Or, uh, yeah, yeah, no, that's true. <laughs> I there's so many like just hilarious lines in this movie. Yeah, no, it could be it, you could interpret this as a legitimate I, comedy. No, Again, if it I mean, if it had better production value, you could just <laughs> interpret this as just like some sort of weird like you said avant-garde comedy. No, this like this feels like a John Waters movie almost. <laughs> this is something John Waters would th This is what John Waters would have made if he didn't do drugs. <laughs> <laughs> Because, like, you know, you've got all these gay themes, but, like, the gay people are exactly as despicable as the straight people. And the straight people are just fucking nuts. Yeah, no, they're <laughs> literal murderers. Every straight person in this movie is a murderer. <laughs> well, so is, so is Arthur. Yeah, that's true, but he's only a murderer after uh, his husband gets murdered, which is understandable. <laughs> But it, he, like, burns down the church, and it's like... Oh, yeah, no, he does do that. I forgot about that like, part. Okay, yes, it's a it's an extremely homophobic church, but like the church didn't do anything to you. Just the priest except that he to killed. Did. To kill your husband, you didn't have to burn down the whole church. Just the priest. <laughs> yeah, which he he burns down by pouring a gallon of water on him. Yeah. Yeah. No. <laughs> that that uh, that church is probably pretty easy to burn though because it's made of cardboard. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, yeah, there was another part that, like, if it wasn't this movie, it was, like, it could have been, like, a legitimately funny scene written by a person, um, where he's, like, the brother comes in and he wants him to, like, accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior and all that shit, and the brother just, like, le is, like, hold on, he leaves for a second, he comes back with a dildo and he's, like, here, put some that's, lube on this and shove it up your ass. That's, like, the <laughs> one... I think genuinely funny moment. Like I, yeah. I think that was intended as a joke, and it is funny. And it lands. It lands. Yes, <laughs> it's the one joke they execute in this movie. I agree. I love. I, I just love like. I love delayed humor. <laughs> I love when there is like just a beat where there is nothing happening. It is dead quiet, and all of a sudden something funny happens. <laughs> like yeah, I. <laughs> Michael, I know you you thought like uh like a lot of this was boring. I disagree. I I think these two films have been like the two funniest movies we've watched or like like the two most enjoyable movies we've watched at the very least. Mm -hmm. I have put the both of these at the top of my enjoyment rankings. I I the thing with this one is I, there are a lot of parts I find funny, especially like just talking back at it now I'm like even realizing there's more that I might have remembered even though we just saw it. But there's just so many gaps, I feel. Like, there was long gaps where I was just waiting for something to happen again. There's a... 
like if a character is going down to get into his car and drive off, they're showing the whole thing. If a character's walking like from one place to another, they're like they're gonna cut a little bit, but they're showing a lot of it. Like it, it just it's not paced well at all. It's kind of weird because like there's shots in the apartment where like it'll cut and they'll be like way closer together than they were in the previous shot. Yeah, <laughs> it's like how what. You're gonna show us every step of them going down the stairs, but then them getting slightly closer to them. Nah, just cut. They're closer. Yeah. I think That's probably that... just bad continuity, but <laughs> why did the woman with the quiz nose cup want him to get him sug- wanted them to get her sugar? Why did she need her sugar <laughs> for her water in her quiz nose cup? I, it was coffee. She was getting coffee. Oh, but there was water. It was water, though. It probably was water. That wouldn't surprise me, but it was supposed to be coffee. And then she's like, there's a whole two inches, which is supposed to sound like wild and unreasonable. I'm like, two inches in a cup is like a lot of space, actually. I think that it's like, I do, it's, you know, it's it's not near the bottom of the list of my Hollow Victory rankings. Uh, Glen or Glenda's pretty high up there. It's top ten. Ben and Arthur, it's not there. I, I do, there are things about it that I really like. It's just, I wouldn't want to rewatch it because I don't think it's consistently, like, I don't think it was consistent enough for me, you know? I'd watch it with a group, like, if we were ever, like, if I was ever, like, with you and that, like, and you wanted to show it to other people, I would I would definitely sit down and watch it again. But it's like, I, you know, I, I, I'm definitely, like, would more soon show someone Glenn or Glenda than, uh, than, um, Ben and Arthur, and when it comes to the funniest movies that we've watched, I, I think Book of Henry and Mac and Me are like much funnier than this. All right. Um, but but I do think that there's some really solid moments in this. There is some like, can we, good. Can we talk funny about the moments. ending? <laughs> yeah. Uh, the, the I mean, yeah. That's so I I I sort of trailed off when I was talking about how this feels like a John Waters movie, <laughs> like because it's you you. The, the gay characters just, like, burn down churches and murder each other and, like, try to rape their brothers. Well, no, I think, I don't think he was trying to rape him. I think he was just, I think he just lost his mind. I think he was just, listen, not to, not to give this movie, um, an, an interpretation at all, but, <laughs> an analysis in any way. But to me, it seemed like... Uh, he was just fucking crazy at that point, and he had planned to just murder him straight up. But, you know, he was just gonna get real fucking weird before he did. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> Worth noting, uh, the, the, the DVD I have of this has been shooting his- uh, Or it has, has Arthur getting shot by his brother and then him turning around and shooting the brother on the DVD menu. <laughs> If you just sit there and let the DVD menu play out, it spoils the end of the movie. Because <laughs> and I, I did, and it also I plays did, the weirdest music. Oh yeah, it right. plays the Entertainer, a completely appropriate track for this movie. <laughs> um, I didn't know that the first time. Like, like I was showing my friends this movie, and I didn't know the menu did that. And I, I put it in, and I'm like, hold on, let me run to the bathroom, and then I come back, and they're like, what the fuck? It spoiled the ending. <laughs> <laughs> now we know he gets shot. You could have been like, "Oh, that's just a dream. It happens in the first ten minutes of the movie, and then after <laughs> yeah, ten minutes, no, I they, guess uh, they would realize you lied." But they, this movie literally just ends with the two brothers shooting them, each other and then dying. That's it. And then the entertainer. Da 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 da. da. Of all the public domain music you could have used, it's like why. Why the entertainer? Ah, <laughs> uh, thank God for Kevin McLeod. Oh yeah. <laughs> Praise be. Praise be. We talked about these two movies in a very different way. Like <laughs> we talked about Glenn or Glenda, like it was like an we were remembering an old friend, and we talked about Ben and Arthur, like we were remembering some dick from high school. <laughs> 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 but a but a funny dick from high school. Like, ah, yeah. oh, remember the crazy shit he used to pull? Yeah. <laughs> remember when he told his brother to stick a dildo up his ass? <laughs> I, I, I just love Ben and Arthur. Like, I think every aspect of this movie is hilarious. Like, there are definitely the down moments. 
but I, I, I feel like the writing is hilarious, the acting is hilarious, the production is hilarious. Uh, I give the movie an 8 out of 10. <laughs> I give it an 8 out of 10. It's just, it's a very funny, very enjoyable film. Just like, like they do everything wrong, but <laughs> that's what makes <laughs> it so entertaining. Uh-huh. <laughs> Michael, do you have anything else to say about Ben and Arthur? Uh, No. Cause I mean I I could just sit here and keep quoting funny lines, but like <laughs> I have one more thing to say. Sure. Uh, the the scene in the restaurant where he's going and giving everybody their coffee water. Um, it looks like like everybody's just sitting there with their arms cl- crossed, with one cup of water in front of them, <laughs> like every single one in uniform, and that's just so weird to me. And when that was that's... going, I leaned over to Matt and I said, "Is this before everybody was on the damn phones all the time?" And yeah, it was because it was two thousand two. I mean, that's just like not giving your extras any direction. Pretty much. No, yeah. I found that funny in the credits. Like it shows the cast that shows extras, and it's just three people. Like, at that point, why not just say restaurant attendee <laughs> one, two, three? Because <laughs> I'm pretty sure that's who the three extras were. There weren't any other scenes that had people in the background. Eh, there might have been, like, one or two. I think when they're on their honeymoon, which lasts for exactly one scene because they can't afford to film anywhere but Sam Rarovich's apartment, uh, <laughs> there was, like, someone, someone else was there. Then I guess the wo- woman who complained about her coffee, uh... Had enough overall to not be an extra. Well, she all she lives in their apartment building too. Yeah, it was the she same comes person. And tells them there's a break in. Yeah, I wonder if that's supposed to be the same character, or just the same actress playing the same character. It's a Played a different sister. character. Yeah, I think it's supposed to be the same character. I think they have the same name. I'm stuck on the cup. <laughs> Why <laughs> is the cup different? <laughs> I I kind of wonder where they filmed that actually. Like Maybe I'm they sure. Just ask some restaurant owner if they could use it like after hours. For yeah, I'm. I'm thing. sure if you like stopped and looked at the uh, the signage, you could figure it out. Could they have, have an A some... in, the, in their health inspection though. So. Oh, that's good. Yeah. Cool. All right. Well, if we've got nothing else, if we've got nothing else about Ben and Arthur, I suppose we could uh, move on to voting. Um. Mitzi, you're our guest, so you get to vote first. Oh no, I get to vote first. I was hoping you two could vote first, and <laughs> we, then I could decide afterwards. I, we can let you go last if you'd like yes, to. Yes, I would like to go last, actually. That All one, right. I would be much preferred going last. Alright, Michael, I'll let you vote first. Vote in Glenn or Glenda. I feel like that's probably that was probably a given based on what I said. I, I do I did find Ben and Arthur funny. Like I'm not trying to be like too like, oh I didn't get anything out of this. I absolutely did. I just it I've laughed harder at stuff we've watched. That's really all I can say. Here's the thing. I, I think Ben and Arthur is like an extremely funny bad movie. And I think Glenn or Glenda is also like a very funny bad movie in parts, but I think there are genuine things I can give Glenn or Glenda credit for. Uh, yeah. Which is more than I can say about Ben and Arthur. There's very little I can give Ben and Arthur credit for. I think Glenn or Glenda uh, does pull off some very interesting things. Sometimes in spite of itself and sometimes just because Ed Wood was an interesting dude. Yeah. What do you think? What what are you voting for? I voted for Glenn or Glenda. Yeah, no, that was going to be the one I voted for. I just wanted to give uh, Ben and Arthur, like, a chance. I was thinking maybe Matt would vote for that one, and it's like, okay. So Michael's going to vote for Glenn and Glenda, Glenn or Glenda. Matt's going to vote for Ben and Arthur, and then I can vote for Glenn or Glenda, and it'll be like, all right, but it's the landslide, okay. <laughs> yeah, I mean... I, I wanted to give Ben and Arthur a fighting chance. Uh, the audience is with us. Uh, it's it's sixty five percent for Glenn or Glenda to thirty five percent for Ben and Arthur, which is like uh, that's a pretty close matchup, all things considered. I I did want to go over like some of the comments we got on this because we did get like some interesting comments. Uh, P T R Greeny says Ben and Arthur far fewer vids on that and so much more to, material to work with from a production standpoint 
I don't think that's true. I think there are way more videos about Ben and Arthur than Glinder. Like, Glinder Glind is one of those, like, classic bad movies that everyone's afraid to touch because it's been done so much. Ben and Arthur, I think, is, like, a very popular video topic. Um, would construct a movie correctly, comparatively speaking, which actually makes me wish he did Ben and Arthur. Fair. <laughs> and then, uh, the angry... Holmesian4556 says, I gotta hand it to Glenn or Glenda, a film that was ahead of its time but poorly executed versus a film that makes after-school specials look subtle and poorly executed. No contest. I'm saying this as a gay woman. <laughs> and then uh, Power Fox said Jack and Jill. I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, uh, Jack and Jill so versus Glenn or Glenda. That's the rematch. <laughs> That's not fair. That's no, it's not, not fair. Jack, Jack and Jill, Jill was my least favorite. Sucks. Jack and Jill was my least favorite movie for a while. Like, uh, I think it was a lot of people's least favorite movie. I think it was like a pretty popular choice for least favorite movie. But then, uh, but then I saw Lion King, and I, I probably saw other things other than that. I'm talking Lion King 2019, if that's not obvious, but. Um, we gotta no, do Hollow Victory Michael and something famous, that eventually. I can, Ma I can Michael go Michael famously off. hates the original Lion King. The original Lion King is Michael's least favorite movie. <laughs> he even, he told me straight up, like, animated movies are only for, like, babies. And, yeah. like, adults shouldn't watch them. Yeah. I voted for Glenn and or <laughs> Arthur. What was my least favorite movie before Lion King 2019? Because I don't think it even was Jack and Jill. I think I, something else came and took its place. Did I say Glenn or Glinda wins? Yeah. Wait, no, say it again. Glenn or Glinda wins. Woo! Hooray! Uh, I need to go for the episodes so, and see how many times I've lost, because I don't think it's happened that many times. But to be fair, I think me and you agree more often than not. Yeah, I think... Yeah, you have only voted against the winner once. In episode five. I, I've, oh, I've won every other time. Yes. How many times have you yeah, lost? It was... Uh, let's see. One, two, three, four? Dang. And uh, one, of, yeah, one of those was uh, fucking Jonah Hex and Ghost Rider, where I was just like, eh, I'm gonna vote for Jonah Hex, just so, like, it's not completely unanimous. Right. Those two are close enough, I guess. So next time on Hollow Victories, it is going to be our 25th episode, live and in person, probably, maybe. We, Michael and I are going to be in person at some point this month, so... Yeah. Hopefully, we, we can do the 25th anniversary, uh, the 25th episode no, not 25th anniversary we've not been doing this show 25 years 25 years um, is not good but like when we only have 25 episodes we're doing like one episode per year so uh i think that is as good an excuse as any to kind of break our rules granted neither of these films are like well received but i i would hesitate to call them poorly received they, they got sort of mixed reviews both of them but i just gotta know i just gotta know who would win this matchup so next time for hollow victories it's space jam versus looney tunes back in action all oh right God, i like both of those <laughs> um, i i have seen space jam recently i have not seen looney tunes back in action since i was very young same and I'm curious which one will win because as a kid i definitely liked looney tunes back in action more because i'm like yeah this is like a more of a looney tunes film this is really funny space jam's like so dumb but then with time, I'm like, I don't remember a lot about Back in Action. I at least remember Space Jam. Space Jam is at least memorable. So I'm kind of curious to see, like, if I enjoy Space Jam more, I'm probably going to enjoy it more in an ironic sense. But that might still be more entertaining than Looney Tunes Back in Action. Well, right, because going off of what I remember, it's like Looney Tunes Back in Action is, you know, it actually does represent Looney Tunes a lot better than Space Jam does. But it's also, like, not 
like peak Looney Tunes or anything, you know. It, so maybe the weirder Space Jam is more entertaining just because it's like it stands out. It's something yeah. very. It's something. It, it's like it's one of the most '90s things ever made. I feel absolutely. Welcome to the Space Jam. Uh, I I think. Who the fuck like, thought? Wait, no, hold on. Now, now that I'm thinking about it, who the fuck was like, yeah, let's put the Looney Tunes in a basketball movie? Why was that the first uh, thought? Because commercials. There, there was commercials with Michael Jordan and Bugs Bunny. And then oh, they're like, really? there should be a movie about this. Oh, yeah. I, I can't believe I've never questioned <laughs> that until now. Like, <laughs> it was literally just right here at this second that my brain went, wait, hold on. Who decided to make a basketball movie about the Looney Tunes? <laughs> uh, my memory of back in action is that, like, most of the jokes are, like, recycled from old Looney Tunes cartoons. My memory of back in action is... Uh, please tell me if I'm remembering this wrong, but it's the, the scene where they're in, like, the art museum. Yes. That's a good scene. I do, I, I, like, that is the one thing I have heard praised from this movie. That's a fun scene. It's I, really I have good. Heard, I have heard people go, like, oh, like, that one painting scene is really good, and the rest of it's, like, kind of boring. Mm -hmm. But, uh, I guess we'll find out next time, huh? Yeah. That'll be a fun one. That'll be a good in-person one. Absolutely. Mitzi, anything to say? Um, I'm happy that I could be here, and... I will be in more. I will be a leech again at some point, probably. Um, I think Chris should have been here. I wanted to say I, that as a start, but I'm like, I'm sad Chris isn't here. Yeah, I I almost offered this to Chris, and then you were like, oh, I want to be in the Pride Month special. I'm like, okay, Mitzi can be the Pride Month guest. Well, we could have done both. We, we could have done both, but we then... We could have done both. I don't know why we didn't... <laughs> Chris will be on another one. Chris, yeah, Chris will be back. Absolutely. Not if I have anything to say about it. No. You don't. I'm getting Chris. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> Anyways, Michael, anything else? Uh, no, this was fun. This was a fun one. I, I did enjoy, I, honestly, if anything, I just, I'm glad we got to watch Edward out of this, but I, I enjoyed watching the other two movies too. I really wanted to be a part of this because I needed more gay movies to watch. <laughs> like, I needed more recommendations for weird gay movies. <laughs> I like weird movies. I like weird gay movies, especially. Those are my favorite kind. Thank you for joining us, Mitzi. You're welcome. Um, even though you live here, it's very easy for you to join in. Like, this This is a great guest episode because I still only have two audio tracks <laughs> to edit. When I have when I have three audio tracks to edit, I'm like, ah, this is like another hour on top of like my normal workload for these. Yeah, right. no, you'll hear my voice in in the background of a couple episodes to, to <laughs> come. I'm sure of it. <laughs> um. Anyways, for my co-host Mackle Shadackle, I am Matt Presents. We will see you in the next one. Happy Pride Month. Peace. <laughs>